it is my pleasure today to listen to, uh, to introduce to you uh, Karen Broadnax with the Department of Children's Services here in Knoxville. Uh, she is the resource linkage coordinator for Knox uh, and has told me she uh, works a little bit with everybody. So she works with families, works with the DCS FSWs. Uh, she has some cases and focuses on getting support for cases, uh, attends, uh, holds community meetings and does training across the DCS region. Uh, and so without further ado, I will turn this over uh, to Ms. Karen Broadnax. Okay, awesome. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm going to do my best not to keep you very long. Um, I am, um, I'm going to try my best to give you a great overview over uh, DCS. Now, it, we can be kind of complicated sometimes, not intentional, just happens to be how we're made and how we're wired. Um, but just in terms of us being able to provide education today, we're just going to go through a PowerPoint and try to see what type of information we can provide for everybody to get us kind of started. So let's see, I think I got us good to go. Um, I am missing one of my screens, but we'll go from here. Okay, friends. So we have changed and updated our mission and vision statement. Um, that is something that does change periodically with the department, just so that everyone is aware of what that is and you will hear it. Um, as far as our mission statement, it is acting in the best interest of Tennessee's children and youth. Uh, fairly simple. And uh, the mission statement is probably one of the ones that I have loved the best since I've been working for the department for these years. And it is children first. Short, sweet, simple, and to the point. So that lets us know what direction the department is heading in. Um, just in our overview, I'm not going to assume that anybody on the line knows a lot of information or about DCS in general, so we're going to try our best to cover all aspects. When we're talking about mandate reporting, uh, who does that include? And so when you look in the Tennessee Code in 37-1503 and 37-1605, and it gives out specifics. It lists pretty much everybody that you can think of, uh, from physicians to teachers to social workers um, to practitioners, judges, neighbors, relatives, friends, and other persons. That And then that way, there's no one that says, well, I didn't know that I was a mandated reporter. It's everybody. <laughs> it's a mandated reporter. It's short, sweet, and to the point to be able to point out who those mandated reporters are. Failure to make a report for abuse um, could result in a, a fine and it could result in a charge. Any person who knowingly fails to make a report uh, commits an offense. First offense would be a class A misdemeanor and it is punishable by 1129. A lot of people don't know that. Second and subsequent can actually lead up to being a felony and punishable for up from one to six years. Um, any person who intentionally fails to report uh, can actually receive a class E felony um, just from the beginning as it is as a whole. Um, now, how to make a CPS referral. And CPS stands for Child Protective Services. We don't want anybody to assume that we know what that is. So when you're calling our child abuse hotline, know that that call center is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days. You remember the post office used to have through the rain, sleet, or snow. Well, no, we really have that. <laughs> and so we are there uh, all the time. There's somebody there covering all 95 counties. Uh, we take in-state calls. We take out-of-state calls. And so re reports are received by telephone, by web, by email, by court, and investigative orders that come in. So these are all the different ways that we may actually be taking in uh, reports that come through our child abuse hotline. Now, how and where does it go? When you call that hotline number, which here is our main number. Now, depending on what field you may be in, for example, like medical or law enforcement, some of them have a direct line, um, but it all goes pretty much to the same call center. Uh, you have two avenues from the general public. One is the telephone number. The other one is the online referral. Now, if it's a non-emergency referral, 
And that doesn't mean, you know, if, if you're making a referral to the Department of Children's Services, yes, we consider it to be important. So it's not to minimize the wording by saying non-emergency. It's very important if we're calling about it. However, it may not be imminent danger. But if it's something that you believe could lead to that and you think it's more serious, then we recommend that you use the telephone number instead of doing the online referral. Some people prefer the online referral because it's fast. You can type in your information and then it provides you with a tracking uh, referral number. You can request that even when you call in for a retracting referral number to know whether or not the case was open and they will provide you with that information. And so when that number is given to you, um, they also generally send a letter follow up. But if they don't, you can use that referral number to follow back up and determine if that case was open or not. Now, I don't want people to think that that information is totally lost. Let me tell you what happens sometimes. Sometimes we may get multiple calls on one family. So we have what's called screen outs. Those screen out reports are maintained in the DCS database. Screen out reports are perceived for the assessment and are determined whether or not they meet a priority response. If it's a screen out, it will go into the system, but it may be given to a worker that may currently have a case open. So say, for example, I'm already working with the family, an incident happened at school, school made a referral, it will come in and say, Karen, there's a referral that has come in on your open case. Uh, so we are made aware of any new information that may come in through a hotline, but you know we always recommend that you go ahead and still do it. So even if your report says on that particular report that it was not accepted, it may not mean that we're not involved. Um, However, I, you know, I encourage people to continue to take anecdotal recordings in regards to some of your agencies and organizations that you may be working with, with information that you may encounter or have to report in the event that you feel the need to make another referral. When it is screened in, the report is processed and, and sent to uh, be assigned with a priority response. So I'm going to review those. If it is not screened in as a child protective services case, it could come to what's called resource linkage. Resource linkage is referrals that we don't necessarily feel in that moment it poses a risk of harm based on the assessments that are done when we make those referrals. So it could come to us for service. We may be looking to try to input a service or try to prevent it from becoming a CPS case. Sometimes we're successful with that, sometimes we're not, and it may ultimately still become a child protective services case. But if we can implement services with the family and work with a family to address those resource needs, then we don't necessarily have to open it up as a child protective services case. We would work that on the resource linkage as limited case. And that limited case would allow us to be able to partner with that family, put in the services. And once we knew that family was stable, we can move forward with allowing them to continue with the services from the community. But now when we're talking about allegations, let's look at that. What constitutes an allegation? Well, first and foremost, the central office will accept reports about allegations of abuse and neglect that meet and establish the criteria for definition of abuse and neglect to determine the response or the priority of the report. Central intake will categorize the report and the information. I'm sorry, I got a little T in the middle of that slide. Y'all see that? I don't know when that happened. We'll just roll with it. <laughs> and information following the abuse. Uh, we have a work aid and this particular link here will be available for anybody to be able to use and go and pull back. It is the very sheet that we as staff use to show you what our definitions look like and what we determine to be abuse and neglect in those categories, but I'm going to go over those allegations. These are the list of allegations that you often will find that will come up. So in regards to those allegations, you see that you have physical abuse which includes physical abuse and drug exposure uh, of a child. So that is a child anywhere from zero up to 17 before they turn 18. Um, we, we follow up with those. There's a more extensive background too on the, um, on the drug exposed child. So I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Under the neglect category, you have environmental neglect, nutritional neglect, medical, education, lack of supervision, abandonment. 
under sexual uh, of sex abuse, you have sexual abuse, and it also includes under sex abuse commercial exploitation of a minor, or in short terminology, human trafficking, even for minors, that is included under this. And it has a more extensive definition in terms of our, our actual policy. Psychological harm is included in that, and then you have child death and near death. These are all the different allegations that we investigate under. For physical abuse, non-accidental physical trauma or injury that could cause, inf could, could cause injury inflicted by a parent, caregiver, relative, or other person who is responsible for care, supervision, or treatment of a child. Um, that's generally what we're looking for when we're talking about physical abuse. You're also looking at uh, caregivers who may fail to protect from a perpetrator or uh, physical abuse on a child, injuries, marks, bruises that goes beyond general um general um, uh, punishment or beyond corporal punishment, broken bones, cups, burns, violent behaviors uh, that demonstrate a disregard, striking a kid in such a way that results in internal injuries um, and a number of things of that nature. And so, you know, whenever we have uh, physical abuse should not be confused with developmentally appropriately discipline remarks of bruises on the buttocks or legs of a child six years of age of older. Um, there are occasions when we have gotten reports, for example, if you have a child who has had some type of disciplinary and punishment, and maybe perhaps, you know, you saw one mark on the leg, but then you saw one on the face or arm. And so, you know, we have had conversations where things of this nature have happened and we still go out on these type of referrals and follow up on them. And uh, I've had an occasion where a kid said, well, I jumped. And when I jumped, I tried to twist away and, and I got hit in the face. So, you know, we will do our due diligence in investigating and talking to all parties to in, ensure that a parent just did not intentionally do something to harm a child in that way. Um, you also have on the drug exposed child, which I mentioned, I would address again. So allegations pertaining to a child under the age of 18 that have been exposed to or experiencing withdrawal from the use of, sale of, manufacture of a drug or a chemical substance um, that would affect the child's physical, mental, mental or emotional uh, well-being, actions or behaviors. Um, that means, you know, from a parent sitting up smoking marijuana in front of a child to various things that go well beyond that. Parents and caregivers um, with substance abuse impairment are the ability to adequately care for children. Are they so impaired that they can't care for kids? Um, and then talking about those who may have current addiction issues that could affect a child's physical, mental and emotional function. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. We talk about drug exposure. Now, I did include this portion of it because it does talk about. Um, hold on, let me pull this down. I can't see my other screen. All right, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. So, on this particular act right here, it, it's talking about the signs of the that was signed into law on July twenty second, twenty sixteen. So addressing the growing opiate problem, this was signed into law in Tennessee specifically, uh, well, it's actually a federal law, but specifically, which is noted at the bottom of the slide, specifically requiring uh, health care and personnel to make a report when DCS has an infant that is identified as being affected by substance abuse or withdrawal from some type of uh, exposure during the prenatal piece of an illegal drug or misuse of illegal drugs or chemical substance or fetal alcohol syndrome. It requires DCS to collaborate with those professionals and partners in regards to that. So I added this information in here because a lot of people have asked, um, you know, how this is done, you know, what allows us to be able to come in immediately on some situations. And so, you know, there is a number of testing that happens in a lot of the hospitals, or if there is a history based on some of the laws that we currently have listed in Tennessee of a family who has had maybe a drug exposed child or a 
termination of parental right or loss of a child at some point that allows them to do this portion of collaboration. So some people have heard of this Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, and I wanted to mention it and also provide you the link so that you can go back for those of you who would like to read a little bit more extensively in regards to what it says in detail, that information is available for you. When you talk about other forms of neglect, um, it could be anything from failure, refusal to provide food, clothing, shelter, education, um, medical treatment, supervision, um, other supports necessary for a child's well-being and development. And so each of the other categories that were listed, it may just depend on a few things that are collaborated within that um, and so those are some of those. Uh, medical neglect, however, is a little different. A situation in which a child does not receive adequate health care, resulting in an actual or potential harm. Medical maltreatment applies to procedures or treatments that a physician or other medical professionals deem necessary. Uh, medical neglect does not include elective health care or treatment. There are certain things that parents can electively choose not to do. For example, immunization shots. So now the governor signed into law on yesterday that if we have children that come into care through the Department of Children's Services, a parent must consent, must consent to immunization shots. If they do not consent to immunization shots, DCS is not allowed to take those children for immunization shots anymore. And so um, that's new. Um, you have some families who have elected to, not, to, to do it and you have some who have neglected not to do it, but it will require us working with those families to ensure that we receive um, permission in order to be able to continue immunizations. Um, abuse, death or um, near death or PND. This is when a child's death is defined as a death caused by abuse and neglect, any unexplained death of a child when a cause of death is unknown or pending an autopsy report, um, any child's death that is caused by abuse and neglect resulting from a parent, caregiver failing to provide uh, the necessary care to keep this from happening, or a near death, which is number two in definition uh, in the code, defines as serious or critical medical conditions resulting in abuse or neglect or sexual abuse or reported by a physician or examined in subsequent. So this is a really hard definition. I left this in here because some of you may be working in the medical field, and this sometimes becomes one of those things that is often asked about how does the department look at this. And so I will tell you that whenever we are working on um, a child fatality case or a, or a near fatality case, we work in concert with local law enforcement or better yet our family crime units. In that situation, what you then find is we are also investigating from a Department of Children's Services perspective. Was this something that was accidental? Was it something that was caused by the harm of the lack of care from a person provided? And how does that impact on the child welfare side? Are there any other children that would be involved in that same situation? Your family crime units, though, are also working it from a perspective of what laws have been broken. And so people have often asked, you know, I don't understand what's happening in cases like this. So families can actually have cases from one incident that would be a dual case. It could show up in criminal court on one aspect and juvenile court on another aspect, at least where it pertains to the children. And so just so that you're kind of aware of some of what that may be in our working in concert with the family crime units, that's part of what you may encounter. Now, Karen, there was a when, question earlier about uh, one of your I slides. I can't see that part because it didn't come up. No worries. I was about to say, I was going to read you the question. Mm -hmm. It was about uh, uh, one of our participants was uh, said they were surprised by the developmentally appropriate discipline related marks and bruises and wanted to know if that was something new or if it was a clarification of an existing rule. Is that in regards to the age? Yes. I think it was on one of your previous slides when you had talked about developmentally appropriate discipline related marks and bruises. 
Right. And, and that and that may it may now please understand if we if we look at it and feel like it's egregious, that's different. But there there had to be some type of decision made in regards to what is considered to be age appropriate in terms of discipline. And so when children are at least old enough to verbally speak and in most cases be able to, you know, understand and verbalize back what may be happening those are kind of where those numbers landed in terms of that slide. And so, you know, like we don't have a number, for example, on this. There's always a question, what age is it appropriate to leave a kid at home alone? Lord have mercy. Okay, so if it's one kid by themselves left at home alone, it just depends on the kid and the level of maturity. I remember my nephew was nine. I He could be left at home alone. He knew not to answer the door. He knew if the telephone ring, he knew what to say, how to say it, very responsible. My son, who was 11, called me and said, it's a man knocking at the door. My son was screaming and crying. I went home, me and police, guns blazing. <laughs> and it was the ADT man. It was the ADT man. So that age, for example, can, can vary. If we had a six-year-old autistic child, no. Okay. Then we have some differences here. So we may still investigate those because of the bruises in the mark, but we are saying to the public at large that parents do have the responsibility and freedom within reason to be able to chastise children. So, you know, there are some general marks that are not real defining, cutting, bleeding, like witch hazel days. We're not talking like the witch hails of days where we got kids and you they can't even wear shorts to school because they so bruised up. That's not what we mean in regards to that. Um, matter of fact, let me roll back to it just so they were all clear on where we are. I'm so sorry to do this. I forgot you were recording. So it says right here, no, physical abuse should not be confused with developmentally appropriate discipline. Related marks and bruises on the buttocks and legs of children six years age of older when there are no developmental or physical delays or past histories of abuse or recent within the past year, uh, including those screen out reports. So when do we respond? The, the, these are our priority response uh, codes that we have. So if you ever happen to say, have somebody say P1 or P2, which I've already addressed the screen in and screen outs and then the confidential notification letter that you get when you make the report through the hotline. So that referral tracking number that you get, that would be the notification. Our priority ones, the response for allegations for ch children that may be in imminent danger. The response window is 24 hours or immediate, immediately at the supervisor's discretion. The window here doesn't mean that we just wait to the 23rd hour to go. It just depends on when the referral comes in, because remember, we have somebody on call with the Department of Children's Services 24 hours a day. There is somebody at the office now, and from 8 until 4.30, they will be on call making responses to any of our priority ones. At 4.30, an on-call person will go on and will stay on call until 8 a.m. the next morning. There's a secondary person on call in the evening time in case the first person is tied up. That's across the board. And so those priority ones give us enough time to find people within that window. In some cases, identifying and finding those families may not be as easy as just going to the home address. Sometimes we may get the wrong address. Sometimes we may get the wrong school. And so that 24-hour window is also our measure for making sure that we immediately work to try to find any of the children that are involved in that case. There are some that if it came in at 2 a.m., the supervisor might be nice enough to say, hey, it's 6.30. I'm sorry to wake you up, but you had a priority one come in at 2.30. It's time to go. And so we may have some of those cases, but few and far in between, generally, whenever we get a P1, we get a phone call and say, we need you to make a move. And it's pretty imminent. Um, on a priority two, that's generally two business days. This is where allegations of injury or risk of injuries are not imminent, they're not life-threatening, or uh, they do not require immediate medical attention. Now listen, listen, I have people who get frustrated because they're trying to mentally process that priority one. 
and the fact that it may take us a 24 hour window to get there. So before I get to priority two, let me explain something. If I go out to a home and I walk into an active meth lab, I have the same uh, method and means that I'm gonna recommend to you. There are some things that we will encounter that we know require immediate attention. I can't pull that kid out that house. I have to walk out that house, get in my car and go around the corner and then dial 911. But then I also have a leadership tree that I have to follow in terms of who I notify. So I am saying to you, if you really feel that a kid is in imminent danger, quicker than DCS may be able to get somebody to come within minutes, you can contact law enforcement either by 911 or the non-emergency number and ask for a well check. And they will probably respond a lot quicker, but I would recommend it be for your true emergencies. So that, you know, if they happen to get there and there is a situation, you know, they will call in the referral, but they generally have a lot of our supervisors and on-call numbers on speed dial. So, you know, it's a matter of them picking up the phone and saying, hey, Tracy, I got a bad situation. I'm going to need one of your workers. I'm working on calling it in now. We do coordinate and work with local law enforcement to make sure that we are teaming. So I don't want you to get the impression that you don't have the ability to make sure the kids are safe. Um, but that is what you would do in a, in a true emergency situation. Otherwise, it's going to be assigned as a P1 or priority one. And then your priority two is within two business days. Now, a priority three means that it poses a low risk of harm. And that can be probably done within three business days. And so these are the three priority standards that we operate by. And that is the policy that goes with those particular standards. Now, I included this information about safe haven law because I'm not really sure a lot of people are sure, sure how this works in our area. And so it's become a very big topic of conversation here of late. But as far as anonymously volunteering an abandoned or unharmed child or infant, that information and opportunity is available. The infant must be uh, 72 hours older or younger, <laughs> 70, 72 hours old or younger, um, and must not have been harmed in any way. Uh, the, the mother must have left the newborn infant voluntarily. She can take the child to any hospital and leave the child. She can take them to a community health clinic. Uh, some of our local fire departments have um, baby drop boxes, and some of our community centers and um, businesses have safe place signs. Uh, we would prefer them probably take the baby to a hospital or a fire department in those cases if they're going to surrender a baby. However, if they go to any safe place and just say they need help and they want to surrender a baby, that's fine. Um, and they can do that voluntarily without a whole lot of questions asked. Um, all of those organizations know their protocol and who to call next in regards to that. But I want to make sure that information is known in case you have a conversation with families and they're wondering how this works, okay? Now, one of the things I do want to make sure that some of you are all aware of, depending on your level of involvement with the department, is we have a SIPIT team, which is the Child Protective Services Investigation Team. And some of their roles is that they have increased some of their involvement with working with us. And so they look at more of our severe abuse allegations and our child death and then the physical abuse where... Um, um, immediate response was needed. So we have some workers who are doing what we call PAIR. And that means that those CPS workers within four hours are responding to reports made by licensed school professionals, daycares, um, mental health providers, and um, medical providers for children that are eight years or younger and could be at risk of harm for physical abuse. So those are a couple extra things that are happening internally. So we are beefing up our efforts and trying to make sure that we're able to respond to a lot of the things that may be happening with our little ones and trying to do more to try to protect them. Um, many of you are familiar with CPS. And so on some of our cases with CPS, we generally try to work those within 60 to 90 days or less. 
Um, oftentimes, though, however, if we feel like there may be a possibility of a case going over that 60 day or 90 day marker, we can change them over to FSS. FSS stands for Family Support Services. So those are case managers who inherit cases from our drug team. They inherit cases from SIPIT or the response teams that we have kind of going on. And then I also mentioned to you that Resource Linkage currently works with all of those teams to try to help address and meet resource needs that may uh, be open on several of those cases. So I wanted to mention those two entities that could still be working from a non-custodial perspective non-custodial, meaning that we can still have extended cases for kids who are not in custody, but they still have involvement with DCS. Um, I'd also like to mention our special investigations unit. We do have an SIU unit internally, so they would be individuals who would still operate like CPS workers, except it is a closed unit. This unit is designed to investigate the professionals. So that would be anyone who's working with children, whether it's um, we're working, we're talking about custodial children, like we're investigating a foster home. It would be this team that did it. If it were non-custodial children and we were talking about daycares or schools or band or after school programs, churches, DCS employees, volunteers who work with children in any capacity, they would be investigated by this particular unit and that information is kept uh, even more confidential is not an open information or knowledge to the rest of the CPS department. So now, one of the greatest uh, things that we're working on doing internally is making sure that we're tapping into community resources. So, you know, we're, we're making greater efforts to try to make sure that we help build community for our families. Some of us, in other words, call it like a system of care. So whether we're working with the school counselors or the therapist or the faith-based organizations or foster parents or mentoring programs or coaches um, or respite care opportunities for families, everything that we can to internally bring together a greater support system for families is what the department is working towards and identifying what some of those resources may be in the community. Now, there is a training opportunity for those that you may either not have this recording available for or they would like to take the online training. Uh, we partnered with the uh, University of Tennessee uh, Swarps Department. And so this link will take you to a training and they can take um, a training about um, DCS and it would actually print off a certificate at the end of the completion of the training. So that information is available for anybody who needs to make sure they have mandatory reporting. Uh, shameless plug, not ashamed ever to give it. We are always looking for foster parents and adoptive parents. So if anybody is ever interested in fostering, Tennessee Fosters Hope is what you would look up on the internet. Uh, we are looking for and always looking for uh, homes that would be willing to take our kids, especially our teens. Uh, we know that when it comes to our teens, kids who are generally ages 13 and 19 make up about 43% of caseloads in Tennessee, about 75% of all children in DCS custody, generally return home to biological family. So that's a great thing. And we want to be able to increase that number all the more. But sometimes our teens need a little bit more help. So, you know, we have about a thousand teens who age out of custody. And some of them are not returning home or being adopted. That can be a challenge. And they are adding to the homeless population that's out here um, in, in our community, which is increasingly growing. So we want to do what we can to put a stop to that. And, um, and we don't want individuals to feel afraid about being single parents or, you know, different walks of life. And you say, well, I don't know if they would consider us. Well, you got to keep in mind, we got kids who are from different walks of life. And um, we learn a lot from them every day. So just keep in mind that one of uh, the most single best things that a kid could have is a caring youth. Um, I mean, a, a, a kid could have as a caring parent or an adult who would be concerned about the overall welfare. Um, and then at the end of the slide are a few of the same links that we had posted earlier about the work aids and uh, the online information about how to file reports and things of that nature. And that in and of itself is the PowerPoint. 
thank you so much for uh, presenting and, and sharing us with the information. I do want to open it up, of course, for questions. Uh, if anybody has any uh, uh, thoughts or comments or, or would like to know more about a certain topic, now is the wonderful time to ask. And you can go ahead and unmute yourself uh, if you'd like to to ask from there. Or feel free to type in the chat if you're not the uh, talking out loud person kind of person. I myself do have one question would uh, I think would benefit from explanation. If you could just explain a little bit between the differences between FSS workers and FSW workers and, and where people lie in custody and with DCS. So your FSWs are your foster care workers. That means when a kid comes into custodial care. So your FSS workers are non-custodial workers. That means that those kids are not in custody and we're still working with them from the home setting. When they're on the foster care side, they will remain with the foster care worker even through a trial home visit. So once all of the plan has been met in terms of a perm plan and all the efforts that are needed to satisfy the court report or court made plans, and they all bring all that together and it's been decided that the kids can go home on a trial home visit or placement, then that foster care worker will remain with them. Sometimes, uh, we will refer them back to a uh, FSS team if we need to just kind of walk with them extensively and, and kind of see what that looks like. However, generally, once the parents have satisfied what they need to and they have successfully passed the, um, the um, trial home visit and uh, we come to an end of the case, we close it and we allow those babies to go home with their families. I see somebody was asking about the immunization piece. Let me pull it up for you. Hold on. So it says, please be aware that Governor Lee has signed into law HB 1380 SB 1111, which takes away the ability for DCS or DCS agents, that means foster parents or providers, to consent for vaccination for children in our legal custody. This law is effective today and applies to all youth, those already in care or those who are newly entering, entering unless we have written parent consent, all parent rights have been, or, or parent rights have been terminated or appeal opportunities are exhausted or written orders. Otherwise, that's what we've been told. So I'm, I'm expecting that we will hear more information coming down the pike about it, but we were told that it was effective immediately. And so I'm sure that there will be a policy coming down that will give us greater explanation of what that looks like. Thank you for that. And there's another question, a couple questions in the chat there. The FSS workers, um, I hope I didn't skip a question. Let me see, bio parents must give permission. Yes, the bio parents must give permission. Um, the FSS cases or family support services, when we do those extended cases, a couple things happen sometimes. The CPS workers may actually put services in and we see that those services are going to extend past the 60 or 90 day marker. So when we transfer over to FSS, it allows us to be able to walk out that service until duration of end or we're able to also put in additional services. So maybe we may use a pilot program like with U Villages that's paid for by DCS, which requires us to be in an open case in order to be able to pay for that for a time until U Villages can switch it over to insurance. And so that would be what some of our extended cases are. The FSS cases can actually go up to 120 days they can they have to do a um, justification for anything over those 30 day markers every time they go over or if they get to 120 days they have to ask for a 30 day extension um, they can't do that for a long period of time because of the course is designed to be 120 day case or less but they have extended those sometimes a little bit further so they're able to put it in home services and if something happens in that family support services case where kids are now back in imminent danger and they were not before or the FSS worker has the authority like a CPS worker to file for a child to be removed. Uh, so they, they have to be able to come in and present that case and say, hey, this is what's happened in the case. And if that leadership says go to the next tier leadership, we have the ability to remove kids if necessary from those, those caveats. Same thing with resource linkage. I very seldom have to 
Um, I think I've only had to do maybe one remove in the last year under resource linkage because resource linkage is voluntary. And so as long as families are wanting services, need help, and are interested in trying to figure out how to do some things or need some advocacy report for somebody who can ask the right questions or pull the different players to the table to get everybody on the same conversation and will for families, sometimes it's as simple as coordinating those services and making sure those opportunities are available. And, and I generally love to do a soft handoff on resource linkage to those who are interested in working with the CHANT program, because I think in some cases, if families had continuous advocates or Tennessee voices or advocates who could stay with them, they seem to be a lot more successful. But when they get frustrated and they don't know how to process through stuff, they just kind of shut down. And our parents do it, too. So it's even difficult for our kiddos when they really need help. Um, Lisa says... How are we doing on foster homes? Lisa, I don't know. I honestly, honestly don't know. I haven't checked lately. I've kind of been, uh, I've been working part-time. So I just got back on full-time at the beginning of May, had a few things in life that happened. And so the number of homes that we had last I checked were just about 200. We normally, as far as like, that's just the DCS homes. But across the board, during the middle of the pandemic, between um, our contract homes and our DCS homes, but just in um, the East Smoky and Knox regions, y'all, we lost like over 400 homes. So it wasn't it wasn't a small number. I think a lot of people did not realize how those homes were being impacted. But you you had foster parents who passed. You had foster parents who lost jobs. You know, I mean, life changed for all of us. And so, you know, they were trying to care for our kids in the middle of all of this. But some of those homes have come back on board. Some have elected not to. We've gotten some new homes that have come on board. Omni is in charge of Harmony. Sorry. Harmony is in charge of um, our recruitment efforts and manning all of those inquiries that are coming across the state. So um, the last I heard, we were doing pretty good on inquiries. She said that we were down, believe it or not, for April. But I think for us, those of us internally, we know that April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. And so even though we may have been down in inquiries for foster homes, we were up in referrals <laughs> for abuse and neglect. That That's fairly common to me. So we'll see what the next month brings. Uh, but, you know, given that we've had some we've had some hard media sales. I can see how that could be impactful, not intentionally, just happens to be one of those things called life. Uh, let's see, the ratio, it depends on the homes, as far as the homes for the ratio for your foster homes, that means the number of adults in the home, the current existing children in the home, you know, the ages of those kids in the home, because our kids would have to have separate bedrooms and sleeping space. And so that comes into play when you're looking at trying to place kids and what that may be. Like if you had a few, a home that maybe was taking two or three small kiddos under the age of 12, because they got like three kids is 15 to 18. Okay, well, that may be a different story, but it just depends on the, the, the size of the home, the number of the kids, and then the needs that may be available. So no scenario was ever the same in regards to that. Karen, I was mostly wondering um, the ratio like in the state of kids who are in custody who need a foster home versus how many foster homes we actually have. Do we know? I that? do not know. Oh, okay. I do not know. Okay. So that that would be Frank Nix is over our placement unit and he would okay. be able to probably tell us more about, you know, like kids who are kind of pending or in motion and yeah. what that looks like. Um, so like in Knox, it varies from day to day. Um, you know, like the most I've maybe seen waiting for a placement have been about 15 kids. Okay. And so we will work with our local foster homes to do tent placements for as yeah. many kids that they can place. If not, then they end up having to stay with us in one of the transitional facilities. Yep. Okay. By the way, we're looking for another one. So mm -hmm. let me put that plug out there as well. Yeah. We have Safe Place and we will have Isaiah House. Yeah. Um, it's scheduled to open, I think, by the end of the month or at least no no greater than June. Okay. Uh, however, if you got like five or six teenagers that may be in placement, it's just not good to have a bunch yeah. of teens together uh -huh. that are, are um, high functioning teens. Okay. And so, you know, um, we, we, we do utilize the transitional spaces, but yeah. it would be nice to have another location in Knox County. So we don't have to drive to Jeff County or Blount County or Lenore yeah. City and 
all the different places, just trying to make sure we place kids um, yeah. in quality placements overnight. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Also, yeah. thank you for the community resource directory. I was very, very excited to get that from you. I know that probably took a lot of work. So thank you for doing that. Man, listen, I should have just started over. That was my mistake. I should have just started from scratch. <laughs> and, you know, but I tried to take my old one. Well, what's still viable? What's yeah. not? Okay, well, that's okay if you do it within a year. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, 22. Yeah. And this is 20. You know, it's a long time. So anyway, we... It, and I already had to make a change in it already. So, I mean, you know, it happens. <laughs> yeah. It happens. It yeah. wasn't major enough to resend it back out to everybody. But oh, okay. yeah, I appreciate it. Let's see. The case will remain emphasis unless the child enters into custody and then will trans. No, 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 no. No. I just, okay, that one just went away. So, listen, Child Protective Services would work that case. And if it is decided that a kid needs to come into custody, they will go straight to a foster care worker and team. That's an FSW. So when we bring them into custody, the case responsibility transfers immediately to a foster care worker. So a lot of times people are trying to reach back out to CPS workers and they are burning it off to another one. And so if you if you find out that a kid has gone into custody, if, then we just need to figure out who that worker is and go from there. OK, because they will switch over to a foster care worker. If it is an extended service, meaning that the kid will remain at home and we'll continue to work on in-home services, then that would be a family support service worker. Hey, That's Karen, two different departments. That's is, what there, I mean. is there a limit on how long um, FSS workers stay in place? Like Yes, that's definite? what I was saying. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, no, no, that was what I was saying. 120 days uh, is, is generally their max. However, they can re uh, review it every 30 days to file for an extension. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, so now if you if you do have any transitional places or you'd like to know more about what that is, you are welcome to email me. Uh, listen, if you have a building, a facility that has some space that's not utilized, possibility of access to showers, bathrooms, um, bedding, or, you know, or a place where I could put some beds or something, you know, get, get me from now through August, uh, call me <laughs> or email me and, and I'll gladly communicate with you tell you what those needs look like for us because we can really use another transitional spot all right and karen has put your survey in the chat absolutely uh last call for questions before we start to wrap things up appreciate you karen putting your email address in there for people to ask further questions uh, and so with that if you all will take that quick moment to click on that link and please fill out that survey for us we'd appreciate it uh, and we will look forward to seeing you all back for our June Learning Cafe and emails for registration will go out soon. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Karen. Yes, and thank you, Karen, so much for presenting for us. I appreciate you very, very much for taking time out of your schedule. All right. Thanks, June. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Thanks.